We're well acquainted with the importance of eating healthily, exercising, and having regular checkups with our doctor. These are also crucial to ensure good eye health, eyes, connection to your overall health. Tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. 21 seasons providing health information based on science, built on trust. Hello, I'm Dr. Jill Cruz, your Prairie Doc host this evening. Tonight's episode is part of our 21st season providing health information based on science, built on trust. We continue to provide trusted health information this evening as we discuss the importance of good eye health. Joining us to address this topic are Dr. Karen Dickus from Ophthalmology Limited and Dr. Vance Thompson from Vance Thompson Vision. Welcome and thank you both for joining us today in the studio here in Brookings on the campus of South Dakota State University. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Dr. Dickus. Yeah, well thank you for having me, this is mm -hmm. an honor. Um, yeah, I actually grew up in Brookings, went to high school here, and then I left for college, went to Creighton University, um, then went on to Des Moines University for medical school, and my ophthalmology residency was in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, after that, I came back to South Dakota, um, practiced general ophthalmology in Yankton for 10 years, and then I kind of had a unique opportunity to go back and do a glaucoma fellowship, uh, which I did two years ago now, and I've been at Ophthalmology Limited for one year. Excellent. Yeah. So you got to come back home. Yes, so it's nice to be back yes. in South Dakota again. All right, yeah. you stop by Nick's on your way home before you leave. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Dr. Thompson, you are a, a fond uh, addition to have back at the show, and we've had you, you many times. We love that. So t um, review a little bit with the audience. I'm sure they know you well. Uh, I grew up in South Dakota too. My dad was a small town family doc. First part of my childhood in Lake Andes. And he was on call every night. Joined the family doctor in Gregory, where it, you know, that's where I graduated from high school and went on to USD undergrad medical school. Interned at Avera, did a fellowship. After I did a residency in in uh, at the University of Missouri Columbia, and then I did a fellowship in Kansas City in refractive and cataract surgery, and have been practicing in Sioux Falls ever since, and and absolutely love it. Wonderful. And we are so grateful to have both of you here tonight. Um, like I said, my, my brother's an eye doctor, and I remember when he told me that they studied you, and you were in his textbook in optometry school. Oh, so, that's neat. Yeah, yeah he, was, he was like, do you know how important this guy is from yeah. South Dakota? So, yes, your, yeah. your reach is worldwide. So. Well, thank you. I, I think I, I want to give credit to my partners. I know Dr. Dickus has great partners, too, and, and I do, too. We're actually you know, in seven different centers and you know North Dakota Montana Nebraska and Iowa and Minnesota and so uh, and South Dakota so I, I I give credit to my partners for 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 that wonderful I'm, I'm so grateful to have both of you here today this is gonna be a great show so before we start our conversation we invite you our audience to submit your questions viewers can contact us three ways call 1-888-376-6225 Send an email to ask at prairiedoc.org or ask on our Prairie Doc Facebook page. We will work to answer as many of your questions as possible, given the time available. Sometimes we receive more questions than we can cover, and we apologize if we do not get to your question. To encourage you to ask questions early, all questions asked in the first 20 minutes will be entered into a drawing for one of our Prairie Doc gift items. The winner will be announced at the end of this program. Your question will remain anonymous, but please provide contact information when you submit your questions. So, and questions are already coming in. I knew this was gonna be a, a good show with lots of good questions. So, uh, we have a couple of emails that have already come in. So, uh, a viewer asked, can a migraine cause increased eye pressures? Um, I'll take that, but um, no. Uh, so they're totally unrelated. Um, Migraines obviously cause a headache classically. Mm -hmm. You can get visual changes with a migraine. Um, they can be separate, just just ocular symptoms, and we call those ocular migraines. Mm -hmm. Or you can get kind of the classic migraine as you get this visual symptom, we call it a visual aura, typically followed by a headache is the kind of classic migraine, but we don't worry about eye pressure in those situations. Okay, so when do we worry about eye pressure? What causes increased eye pressure? Yeah. 
So yeah, that's the classic term for glaucoma is um, in general terms is when the eye pressure is too high and it damages the optic nerve. There are certain types of glaucoma where you can have actually normal pressure that can still cause damage, but classically it's high pressure causing the damage. And that damage can result in blind spots in your vision. Typically it starts peripheral, um, but again, certain types of glaucoma can affect the center vision uh, more early on. And that's why it's, it's um, kind of a, a, a sneaky disease and that you're not gonna notice anything is wrong until it's too late. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's why we really, we always hound on people to, you know, make sure you get yearly eye exams, especially as you get older, uh, to, to watch for glaucoma and mm -hmm. catch it early. Yeah. So then how do they screen for that glaucoma? Is that the one with the little puff of air in the eye? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, there's multiple ways to do it. Um, you know, we actually put a little numbing drop in and touch the cornea and it compresses it and we can do the math to tell us what the inside the eye pressure is. And like Karen said, it's a painless disease, and so people will not realize that their peripheral vision is gradually being mm -hmm. taken away, and by the time they notice it, they've lost it. So it's not like cataract surgery where we can do surgery and get that vision back. Mm -hmm. It's gone permanently. And so, like Dr. Dick has said, whether you've had eye surgery, whether you see good at glasses or not, you should have an eye exam every year. And I also tell people, don't rub your eyes. People don't realize that mm -hmm. eye rubbing can ruin their cornea, might need a corneal transplant, oh, wow. it can affect their retina. People need to get their allergies and dry eyes treated by mm -hmm. their eye doctor. And so eye exams and don't rub your eyes. Okay, very good. All right, another viewer said, will a laminar hole progress to more retinal damage and how does it affect your vision? First of all, what's a laminar hole? <laughs> It's basically, basically a partial macular hole. So um, you can have, like I said, partial macular hole where it's not full thickness, we call it. And a ma your macula is your center vision. So it's the most important vision for high quality center vision. Um, and that's also the part that affects like macular degeneration. Okay. But so just as we all get older, we're all at risk of having problems in the back of our eye. And so you can develop these lamellar holes. They don't necessarily progress and they may or may not really be affecting your vision. But if it does progress to a full macular hole, then typically surgery is recommended for that with a retina specialist. Okay, all right, interesting. Well, um, one of our Prairie Doc assistants had a question. What's a good age to get LASIK eye surgery, Dr. Vance? Well, you know, um, you really wanna wait till your eyes have gone through the majority of their changes. You know, we could do 10 year olds, it would work just as good, but they're still changing. And so that's why we like to wait until the doctor says you're starting to stabilize. And so some people will say, you know, 21 years of age, but I also say if you're going to college and you're really studying hard or you're gonna to go to professional school after that, your nearsightedness can progress. Mm -hmm. And so it's a good idea to have a, a, a good talk about when that stability happens. Now, if someone does have LASIK and their eyes change 10 or 15 years later, you can add power to it with a laser fine tune also. Okay, so it's not a one and done, you're stuck with whatever. Correct, it's not a one and done, but at the same time, when you do LASIK, you don't wanna thin the cornea too much, and so your doctor can tell you if you're a good candidate for it now, and is my cornea thick enough if I need a fine tune on the long run, which I think are important questions. Yeah, definitely. All right, well, a caller says they have a family history of macular degeneration and is wondering if the supplement Persevision can be taken as a preventative measure. Well, so they've done big studies on this, mm -hmm. and um, the study found that people, what we categorize as intermediate or moderate macular degeneration are the ones that qualify for the, the ARES vitamin, or the data has been there to prove that it maybe helps slow down the progression of the disease. I believe it decreases the progression by about 25%. So it's not a cure, it's not gonna make it better, but it can help slow it down. So usually, and we see a lot of people that maybe aren't quite to that level, they have more early changes. Um, I usually tell them, you know, there's no data to support taking that is gonna prevent it. Um, it's not gonna hurt you to take it, but you know, we don't have any data to support taking it earlier on. Okay, sounds good. Well, a caller from Sioux Falls said they had cataract surgery three weeks ago. How long did the halos last after the surgery? Well, it d depends. You know, like if they are going for really good vision without glasses mm -hmm. and they're using what we would call a single vision implant, 
those halos typically don't last too long. So there can be normal healing halos. If they have some leftover astigmatism or they're gonna need some glasses correction, they're gonna have some of those halos until they get those new glasses. And then if they're doing an advanced implant, what we call a multifocal implant, that helps you see distance, intermediate, and near without glasses, those can have halos also. So there's multiple causes for halos. Time, treatment can really help those also. So they'd get a lot better with time. Okay. Yeah, and we usually say, you know, their brain is amazing, but it takes time to neuroadapt. So yes. especially if they get an upgrade lens, it can take, you know, six months or more, even up to a year to fully adapt to their new vision and the, some of the halos and things they could see. Okay. Excellent. So a caller said they recently had a cranium craniotomy to remove a meningioma and that was resting on her optic nerve and lost most of her vision. She's wondering how long, if at all, will it take for her vision to return? Yeah, I mean, I think it really depends on her exact situation um, and how long, you know, it had been pressing, how much damage was done, but I think as a general rule, anytime you have these neurologic uh, things, same with like a stroke, with time you can get some vision back, mm -hmm. but it's never gonna be what it was, and it's, I think every case is very independent as far as how much they will get back. And again, I don't think it's a hard, fast rule, but a good six months typically is what we tell people to, to see those kind of neurologic stability changes. Okay, so kind of be patient, yeah. and, and we're gonna see, time will tell exactly. what you're expecting. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So, uh, viewer says they had RK surgery 30 years ago and have heard that this can complicate cataract surgery. Is that true? Well, I do a lot of cataract surgery on people that have had RK or laser vision correction. And, you know, there's, you know, we do mathematical calculations because vision is really the cornea, the front window of your eye in front of your pupil, and the lens behind your eye, the two add up to focusing light. And probably a little bit more complicated than, than people want to hear, but the curvature of that cornea really matters. And if you've had RK or laser vision correction, it just takes a different formula for that curvature, so it doesn't complicate cataract surgery. Okay. I'm starting to get flashbacks to physics and <laughs> and prisms and angles of light and yeah. I would say one thing I usually just um, counsel my patients that have had RK is sometimes it takes longer for their vision to stabilize. Right. You know, like a lot of people after cataract surgery they see really good by you know a few days for mm -hmm. sure by a week. Sometimes and not everyone it depends on you know how much RK uh, procedures they had done. Um, but some people it can just take longer for their vision to kind of get to that final end point. And so I just usually counsel on them uh, preoperatively. Okay. I think it's a, it's a really important point, what, what Karen just said. And so we, we also do these implants because a lot of people, you know, because things like laser vision correction are so accurate for helping people see without glasses, mm -hmm. they think cataract surgery has the same accuracy to help people see without glasses. Mm -hmm. And with cataract surgery, you know, you start out with a lens that's very mm -hmm. thin and it gets thick eventually when you're older, almost like a grape. And so when you put the new thin lens in, it can sit further or closer to your pupil and it changes its whole power. Mm -hmm. And so we do a lot of these light adjustable lenses where you can actually change the power inside the eye. And like Dr. Dickus said, we'll you know, wait oftentimes three months to start that process mm -hmm. with RK just to let it stabilize. And same thing with laser vision correction, we'll wait longer to let to just make sure that when we stabilize it, that vision for life is set right. Okay, so what it, uh, define for our viewers, what is RK surgery or what is that used for? Well, RK is, it's incisions in the cornea that were actually popularized in Russia. And what those incisions would do, almost uh, not in the pupil, but outside of the pupil, and what they would do would relax or steepen the outside of the cornea and flatten the center. Because what happens with nearsightedness, the patient was born with a cornea that's too curved for their eye, so the incoming light rays were bent too strong, and that's why their glasses are thick on the edge and thin in the center, they have a negative curve. And so when you do RK surgery, you're helping to lessen that curvature. When you do laser vision correction, you're lessening that curvature so that they can see good without glasses. Okay, 
Wow, well, yeah, this is physics. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, no matter who you are, cataracts will likely become a part of your life. Luckily, there are advancements in the artificial lens implants to restore clarity and more. Prairie Doc reporter Sam Schauer spoke to studio guest Dr. Vance Thompson about artificial lens implants. Cataracts can happen to everyone as people age, said best by Dr. Vance Thompson from Vance Thompson Vision. And you live long enough, just like wrinkly skin and gray hair, everybody gets cataracts. A solution to cataracts is the use of artificial lens implants for eye focus. What it does is it restores the focus power that the lens used to do so that you can make a choice based on that lens implant, whether you want a thin pair of glasses with bifocals or whether you want no glasses. Dr. Thompson says the practice of removing cataracts has grown immensely. And in the old days, when they just removed the cataract, they had to replace that focus power into glasses. That's why the glasses were very thick. And around the late 1940s is when implant research took off. They figured out how to create an artificial lens implant to put in place of where the cloudy lens was. And that technology just kept getting better and better and better. Dr. Thompson says he and the patients have a discussion before surgery. Do I want to replace everything that my natural lens used to do, or do I want to just replace part of it? That discussion is summed up to whether patients want to have their clarity restored, but wear glasses for reading. And one of the things about advanced implants is they do cost extra. And so if you're okay with glasses, a traditional implant that just replaces the clarity and not the reading range, then you just replace the reading range in the glasses. Or have everything replaced and ditch the glasses. But there's patients who also want to replace everything. They want to replace the clarity that the lens used to do, and they want to get back the reading range of their younger years. Whatever the patient chooses, Dr. Thompson recommends getting implants for one convenient reason. Once you've replaced the natural lens, there's really nothing to change. It's not like you gradually drift into readers. It's a correction for the rest of their life. Well, thank you so much for showing. I always like seeing behind the screen and you know, kind of peeking in the OR there. So. Dr. Thompson, could you explain a little bit about the difference between the traditional lens implants and the advanced um, lens implants? Well, a traditional lens implant, we would call a monofocal or one focal point implant. It's going to bend the light rays and bring it to one focal point. And you can choose where you want that to be without glasses. Some patients say, I want to have it be my best at a distance with my glasses off, and then they wear their glasses, you know, to help with intermediate and near trifocals, you know. And then with an advanced implant, that it, it is doing all three focal points, distance, intermediate, and near. We call them trifocal implants. And those are more for patients who really want to do a lot without glasses when they're done. And I had the honor of being in our country's first trifocal implant study. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really exciting because at the end of that study, the trifocal patients, when they were asked, would you do it this way again? 99.2% of them said they would do it that way again because they loved the freedom. Mm -hmm. All right. And with those trifocals, do they have to like look at different areas like you would with real trifocals yeah. to get the... That's a really good question, but no, it, it happens seamlessly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we, in, in general, will talk with patients, you want to do a lot with glasses after cataract surgery, then a single vision implant works great. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do a lot without glasses, then a multivision or trifocal implant works great. I feel like it really gets down to that. Does a patient want to do a lot with or without glasses? Okay. And both patient populations are, are excited about the results of cataract yeah. surgery. For oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. I guess I would maybe just add kind of the third option is what we call a toric lens that oh. corrects astigmatism. Um, and that can come in a trifocal form as well. Um, but so that can be a nice option for patients that have a lot of astigmatism. Mm -hmm. um, it does come up, you know, at upgrade costs, kind of like the trifocals do as well. But 
And then other comment is some people will come to us and say, oh, I really want to be out of glasses. You know, we do their eye exam, we might find different reasons why they're not a good candidate for the multifocal lens or the trifocal lens. Um, so we always do our best to try to weed out to make sure who's a good candidate and who's not because ultimately we want the patient to be happy. And if you have other problems going on in your eye that you might not be as happy with the quality of your vision with those kind of premium lenses. But yeah, if you're a good candidate and you're, you're wanting that, they can do really well. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, viewers have lots of eye questions <laughs> here, so we'll keep going. Uh, what do you guys think about Zydra for dry eye? Is that a good product? I'm a big, I'm a big fan of it. You know, a lot of people don't realize that the most powerful focusing element of their eye happens right where the air meets their tear film. Mm -hmm. And I know you don't want to hear about more physics. <laughs> Bring it on. It's, it's because, you know, it's the, because of the difference in refractive index yeah. between the mm -hmm. air and the tear. But the bottom line is the most powerful focusing element is your tear. And so if you have dry eyes, it's like having that rough spot on your windshield. Okay. And you know, right when it starts to rain and it looks blurry, you don't even want to start your windshield. But once you get a good skim going, you got a nice smooth vision through the smooth windshield. And Zydra treats something very important because the tear film, a lot of people don't realize, has over 1,500 proteins. It is an anti-inflammatory, it's an antibiotic, it's an antifungal, it carries oxygen, it carries glucose, it carries, it's the blood of your cornea. Mm -hmm. And so it not only is therapeutic to your cornea, but it moisturizes and provides vision. Well, Zydra is a great anti-inflammatory. And so it treats that inflammation that happens as eyes are getting drier mm -hmm. and there's less tear mm -hmm. to treat the inflammation. Okay, interesting. Well, a viewer from Baltic said, what is the treatment for epiretinal membrane? First, what's an epiretinal membrane? <laughs> I feel like we're having to do a lot of definitions yeah. here. Um, <laughs> so it's a, basically, again, going back to the retina, the back mm -hmm. wall of the eye, and your macula, your center of vision, like we were talking about earlier, you can develop this kind of layer of scar tissue on the surface. And again, it can happen to any of us just as, as we age. And sometimes certain um, you know, eye conditions can predispose you to it as well. Um, but mo I'd say majority, I don't know the percentage, a retina specialist would probably even know more, but majority of them aren't going to be symptomatic and never needing anything done, or they maybe mildly affect the vision. But if they do get to the point where they are, you know, significantly affecting the vision, a retina specialist can do a surgery to help um, to improve that. Okay. All right. Well, another viewer said, um, what causes his wife's glaucoma when she always shows normal pressure? They routinely and daily apply uh, by Zula. By Zolta. <laughs> by Zolta, thank you. Drop in each eye. So, yeah, you know, glaucoma, I've learned, especially as I've done additional training, and it, it's, it's a very humbling disease at times. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it can be very difficult to treat. I would say a majority of patients that have glaucoma are going to live, live their whole life and not really notice they have a problem. You know, maybe you don't think they need the drops, even though their doctors tell them they do, that kind of thing. Um, but there is, like I was mentioning earlier, there's a subset of glaucoma that we call normal tension glaucoma, where we've never caught them at a high pressure. Um, but yet they seem to be having damage. And sometimes that form of glaucoma can be harder to treat. And that is the form of the glaucoma that tends to have more changes in the center of vision earlier on. So it can be more affecting the vision. Um, but yeah, so it, there is, it is normal, or it is possible that you have normal pressures and still have glaucoma. All right, well, uh, another viewer says, what are floaters in the eye? Well, floaters <laughs> are, you know, in the vitreous, behind the lens and in front of the retina and in kind of the largest space of the eye mm -hmm. is what we call the vitreous cavity. And the vitreous is a gel and that gel attaches to the retina. And as we get older, that gel turns to more liquid-like. Mm -hmm. And when it reaches a certain amount of liquidness, it can collapse and it can separate from the retina. And we call that vitreous separation a posterior vitreous detachment. Way different than a retinal detachment, but you still want to be seen when you have new floaters or you have flashes of light, because that can mm -hmm. sometimes represent the tugging mm -hmm. that the vitreous can create on the retina. So you call your eye doctor, you get your pupil dilated, mm -hmm. and they look and they'll tell you the vitreous gel separated, the retina mm -hmm. looks just fine, or if there's a little tear, they'll send you to a retina specialist mm -hmm. to laser it. 
but the floaters are in the vitreous gel and most do not need to be treated. Most get better with time. Every now and then you need them removed and a retina specialist would do that through a process called a vitrectomy. All right, so, so removing that and then replacing it with something else that's clear? Or yeah, it, it, it really, <clears throat> we just replace it with a balanced salt solution typically, okay. and, and, and then the eye's own fluids are mm -hmm. taking care of it. If there's retina issues, sometimes mm -hmm. they're putting gas or silicone okay. in there, but if there's not retina issues, uh, the eye mm -hmm. refills that space just fine. Okay. Yeah. All right. So a question that I get from my pilots, is there anything that can be done for color blindness? Because that affects their ability to be a pilot, especially yeah. at night. Not that I'm aware of. <clears throat> Right. There's, there's, there's glasses that will create certain <coughs> wavelength changes to see perceptually uh, the color changes, but there's no, no treatment for color no blindness, treatment. and it's very common. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So. All right. Well, a 90-year-old gentleman from Sioux Falls is wondering what could potentially be causing him to see shadows out of the peripheral vision that are not actually there. I guess I would, maybe my first thought is, did he recently have cataract surgery or has he had cataract surgery? Um, there's this dysphotopsia that we know can happen after cataract surgery. It's typically described as like a shadow or a flicker. It's always on the temporal side of the vision. I mean, usually it goes away with time because again, your brain adapts and, and you don't notice it as much. But so that's one possibility. Um, you know, if this is not related to cataract surgery and he's having new vision changes, you probably should get an eye exam and just make yeah. sure. Okay. You know, other things we think about would be like retinal issues going yeah. on. Um, so it's really hard to say without yeah. knowing more of the history. All right. So uh, viewer wonders, why do eyes get blurry when you look at your phone screen too long? I love that question. <laughs> That's, uh, so that gets back to the tear film. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, a nice healthy tear film, when you blink, will stay nice for about 14 seconds. Just like your windshield, oh. you know, uh -huh. it, it, it looks good for a bit, but then yeah. you wait for that windshield to come back because the rain film mm -hmm. breaks up and light rays are ricocheting all over. So if your tear film is breaking up, it's okay. really blurring. And so what happens when we read or we look at a computer or drive is our blink, blink, blink reflex goes down. People have a tendency to mm. stare. And you'll notice a baby, oftentimes mm -hmm. they can look at you for a minute without blinking because yeah. their tear film's so stable. But as people get older and the eyes get drier, I would tell that person to blink more, maybe use some artificial tears, do some relaxing with your eyes shut and refresh that tear film for better vision. So my grandparents were right when they said they were resting their eyes. Yeah. That was a good thing. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Excellent. All right. So that's good for the tear film. Yes. Rest your eyes. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. So a uh, 53-year-old gentleman says they have a fairly significant astigmatism, but fairly stable vision. Are LASIK techniques getting better to make it more effective for people with astigmatism? Well, you know, the cornea, the front window of the eye, if it's perfectly round like a basketball, mm -hmm. That's no astigmatism. It's just nobody has a perfectly round cornea. You can always measure a little bit of astigmatism. It's the most common correction mm -hmm. there is. And so when a cornea gets to be more football shaped, yeah. more of a curvature, let's say from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock, and less curvature from 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock, the increased curved aspect of the cornea is bending light fast. Yeah. And the less curved, like the football, is bending it slow. So you get two focal points, and to tell you the truth, you get a range of focal points in between. So mm -hmm. astigmatism blurs all distances. And we've been correcting it with laser vision correction for over 25 years. You can correct it with glasses, you can correct it with contacts, uh, and then, as Dr. Dickus said, with toric implants, mm -hmm. that's an astigmatism correcting implant. So we can measure astigmatism, and we can treat it nice with optical devices or surgery. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. So, all right, a uh, caller said they had shingles about 15 years ago. Do they need to worry about having cataract surgery? What, could their shingles flare up again? And there's always that possibility. We don't have the you know, magic ball to, to know that. Um, some surgeons, I mean, I'll usually start them on an antiviral a few days before the uh, surgery in hopes that maybe it cuts down their risk of having a recurrent episode, but that is always a possibility. Thankfully, I think it's pretty rare, okay. um, but, but it can happen. Excellent. All right. Well, glaucoma is the second leading cause of blindness worldwide and sadly has no cure yet. 
Our studio guest, Dr. Dickus, spoke with Prairie Doc reporter Sam Schauer about this eye disease. Dr. Karen Dickus is an ophthalmologist for Ophthalmology Limited, and she warns patients of glaucoma. It's a condition where the eye pressure is too high and it causes damage of the optic nerve. And the optic nerve is what is needed to get the signal from um, our eye to our brain so that we can see. Glaucoma can affect all ages, although it's more common in older adults. And Dr. Dickus says once patients have glaucoma, they're stuck with it. So glaucoma is what we call the silent thief of sight because you're not going to know anything is wrong until it's too late. And so that's why we really encourage people to go in for yearly eye checks. Um, that's really the best way to detect it. Dr. Dickus says glaucoma is genetic, and if people have family members with glaucoma, they should be checked. As a general rule, I think the Academy recommends that, you know, have an eye exam once in your 20s, once in your 30s, and then 40s, depending on if anything is seen. Dr. Dickus says there aren't any lifestyle choices that can raise glaucoma chances. However, she says aerobics, like walking, can help control glaucoma pressure. We know that aerobic exercise is good for people that have glaucoma. If they are consistent with it, it can help keep their pressures more controlled. But reducing eye pressure is the first step. We like to see usually a 20 to 30 percent reduction in the pressure is, is a good starting point. And then once we get that reduction, then it's just following that patient um, over time to see, OK, is that pressure low enough for them or do they need to be lower? Are they still progressing? That could be in the form of drops, lasers or surgery. But she says they're for one goal. So all the drops and the laser that we do in the office are trying to get that drain to work better. And at sometimes at some point that drain just isn't functioning enough and we have to give you a new drain. And her crew want to help as much as they can, but it's on the patient to come early for checkups. Patients come to us, we want to be able to help them, but especially if they already have advanced loss when they come to us, you know, we can't get that vision back once it's gone from glaucoma. And I think that's another key point just to remember is prevention is huge with glaucoma because once it's gone, it's gone. Well, you guys have just the most interesting equipment. Yeah. I, I'm always amazed when I walk into an optometrist or ophthalmologist office. Yeah. You've got cool toys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could you explain a little bit more about the different um, treatments you have? How do you decide between drops or lasers or surgery? How do you know what's right for the patient? For glaucoma, mm -hmm. you're referring to? Um, yeah, I mean, so classically drops is always like the first line of treatment and still very commonly is. Um, but we have really good data now to support what's called an SLT laser, so tr selective tr laser trabeculoplasty, which basically we're stimulating the cells of the drain of the eye to try to get them to work better and outflow better. And we have good data to show that it maybe helps stabilize the disease if we do it especially earlier on in the disease process and then also helps lower the pressure. Um, so I tend to offer it early on. Sometimes as first line treatment if patients are amenable to that idea. A lot of people, you know, get a little nervous about the idea of a laser and so they often want to start with drops. We follow up, see how the drops are working, consider laser as a next option or if the drops aren't getting us where we want them to be. Um, but so those are, those are definitely like the first um, step and we actually have several different drop options, two brand new ones even in the last five years. Which, so new options are always great because there's definitely patients where you get to the point where they're on all the drops we can do. We've tried several lasers and really then we're looking at bigger glaucoma surgeries to bring their pressure down. Okay. All right. Well, another viewer said they had cataract surgery about 15 months ago and just had their regular eye exam today. The eye doctor said they're starting to cloud over again. Will they need to have surgery again? Well, the, the cataract sits behind the pupil in a capsule. It's almost like a grape in a grape skin. And when we do surgery, the patient's laying down, we make the pupil big, dilate it, mm -hmm. and then we remove a five millimeter opening. So we open that capsule, it's called a capsulotomy, mm -hmm. and then we take out the cataract and your new implant's gonna sit in that same home. So we put the implant in, and then when the patient sits up, the opening is right behind the pupil. The light goes through the opening, through the implant, through the back capsule, back to the retina. But the back of the capsule can get hazy, mm -hmm. and that's where we laser that. It only takes about 30 to 60 seconds. And so technically it's a surgery, mm -hmm. but it's a relatively easy one to go through and painless. Okay. And then light can go through both openings and the implant unimpeded. 
Okay, so it wasn't that the lens that you put in was a problem, it's behind it. Yeah, the capsule got, got hazy. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Well, a viewer from Madison wonders, why do your eyes water when it's cold or windy outside? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a reflux mechanism with that. I mean, I think that's pretty common. And if you're prone to dry eye, you may have more issues with that. Um, common thing else we see people for is dry eye, and one common symptom with that is, mm -hmm. is tearing. Because again, your eye is dry, and it's trying to make these reflux tears. So, and then again, just when you're out in those situations, you're just more prone to get that reflux tearing from the wind and mm -hmm. different triggers. Okay, and we, we were talking about how important that um, tear membrane you know, yeah. that mm -hmm. is. Is there like artificial tear ones? Are there good things over the counter? Is there a specific brand that you'd recommend? or? Just There's, anything that's lubricating? I think that what's really important is you have an eye exam because there's different types of, of dry eye. Okay. You know, people mm -hmm. are amazed when you start to teach them that you've got, you know, the in the white part, the conjunctiva, we call it, you know, mucin, it's real sugary mm -hmm. and it coats the cornea. And then we got the watery portion that's in the lacrimal gland and, and, and then that's the next layer. And then in your eyelids, is the olive oil layer, we call it the mybum. And that is what helps create a protective outer tear so that you know your tears don't just evaporate. People with a reduced mybomian layer, they don't want the vent on in their car because their tears are just drying so quickly. So you, you have an eye exam, decide which layer is deficient, and then which drops are the best for you. And a lot of those drops are over the counter, yeah. some are prescription, but you really don't want to just shotgun it and try something. You should go have a good eye exam and then be more specific in your treatment. All right, and what are your thoughts on Visine? I, I, my brother has a very strong opinion on Visine. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think as a general rule, we don't usually recommend it. I mean, there's the biggest problem, I think, is just because there's so many different options that, that come in the Visine um, mm -hmm. parity. And so you can be on an allergy drop when you have dry eye. I mean, you just, again, you just want to make sure you're on the right thing. Mm -hmm. Not that they can't work if you're on the right type of drop, but I, I tend to um, advise for different, um, different branded eye drops, I yeah, guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. Okay. And one of the things with Visine, it's kind of the same way with you know things that vasoconstrict mm -hmm. when you're congested. Mm -hmm. um, if you use them a lot to make your blood vessels constrict and the redness go away, mm -hmm. when you, if you use it too much, your blood vessels start to rely on it mm -hmm. and you'll get this rebound mm -hmm. redness mm -hmm. that is even, even worse. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of the hardest things with dry eye is nighttime. Okay. That's when eyes really dry out, and that's why if people are waking up with dry feeling eyes and they're using a ceiling fan, oh. I'm telling them, you probably don't want to do that or reverse the blades mm -hmm. so that the air isn't blowing on you and watch your home humidity. Okay, well another question, um, how effective is broadband light and thermal eye treatment for dry eyes? Yeah. yeah. More to that. So that, that, those would be more that olive oil layer, you know, what we call the mybomian glands that are in your eyelids. Mm -hmm. um, those, you can actually in an eye exam push on the lids and you can see those little uh, olive oil secretions <laughs> ooze out and you know they're nice and clear and healthy. But in people where they're not, it's like the Crisco in the can that turns white. Oh. Uh -huh. And so what you want to do with Crisco in the can is put it, warm it up mm -hmm. on, on the pan and then it flows. Well, you can do the same thing with the eyelids. You warm them and it, you know, makes it more flowable and then oftentimes we'll squeeze it a little bit, <laughs> squeeze out almost like the toothpaste until uh -huh. it becomes olive oil. <laughs> and it, so these types of treatments that warm the mybomian or olive oil producing glands can be very effective in helping reestablish flow. Interesting. And one thing I <laughs> commonly tell people is just a home remedy is just putting heat on them on themselves with a warm washcloth, warm heat, um, mm -hmm. or there's different eye packs you can get that you know you put in the microwave. They stay warm for a period of time. That warm heat for a good yeah. five ten minutes once a day can help you get just baseline better production of your natural tears. But okay. the same kind of yeah. concept. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, a uh, caller from Wakanda is wondering what causes macular degeneration and what can be done? Age is the biggest yep. risk factor. Okay. Um, genetics play a role too, but I mean, we're all 
susceptible to that as, as we mm -hmm. age. I mean, that there's multiple factors, environmental factors, I'm sure, play a role too. We don't know everything about it, but we do know that age is the number one risk factor followed by genetics. Um, there's not really anything you can do necessarily to prevent it other than eating healthy. So we know antioxidants are good for the eyes and just having a good overall uh, well-balanced di diet um, it can be helpful in prevention. Okay. So my doctor told me I have a small cataract. When is it best to have surgery? Early? Later? How do you, when do you know it's time to do surgery for cataracts? Well, you know, we all get cataracts if we live long <clears throat> enough. And the fact of the matter is the majority of cataracts never get removed. Mm -hmm. So when you hear the word cataract, it doesn't automatically mean surgery. So if with your glasses or however you're doing your seeing, that you're happy with your vision in daytime and nighttime, and your doctor says you have an early cataract, you don't have to worry that it's in there hurting something. Okay. But when it gets to the point where it's grown enough and that best possible set of glasses doesn't give you the image quality to bring you vision joy, uh, then it's time to start talking about things like cataract surgery. But you still want to look at the whole eye and make sure the tear film and retina and everything else is good too. But about 30 to 35% of cataracts get removed. Okay, wow. All right, well, uh, viewers wondering, can one's eyesight improve with age? I guess if you're worsening from cataracts, you may remove it. <laughs> there we go. Um, but as a general rule, no. Um, you know, uh, it, just like anything in our bodies, you know, they do age and, and can deteriorate from different conditions over time. But so I would say as a general rule, no, unless you have some condition that we can fix like cataracts. Okay. One of the things that, that happens, because I agree with Dr. Dick, is it's, it's tough over time for your age to, your, your eyes to get better. Typically it gets worse. But a couple of conditions where it does happen, if you're farsighted, mm. in your younger years, that lens behind your pupil is flexible. And it can, it can zoom through the farsightedness. And, and, and sometimes farsighted people have the best vision. They see the furthest. Mm. And then as they get closer to their 40s and their lens is getting stiffer, that same lens that won't read and they now need readers or bifocals, mm -hmm. That same lens that's compensating for their farsightedness, uh, you know, is 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 not compensating. So a farsighted person can actually get uh, worse with time if they're not able to compensate for it. But some farsighted people, the opposite can happen. If their lens is working too hard and it's making them nearsighted, mm -hmm. as they get to that age where it's relaxing, they're like. Why, why is my vision getting better? Yeah. It's because their lens is relaxing. And so the fact of the matter is most people don't get better with age, but some people, their lens can change in a way mm -hmm. that their vision gets better. And some people even refer to it as second sight. Mm -hmm. You know, they needed glasses all these years and they have a developing mm -hmm. early cataract. And they're like, wow, I don't need my glasses as much as I used to. So. Okay, well that's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, again, physics. <laughs> it's all physics. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. So, uh, a caller is wondering what can be done to remove the skin tags from under the eye? So, typically those are removed by, in, you know, incision, by, by cutting them off. Um, depending on, you know, what exactly they are, there's, um, you know, little skin tags like you said. They can be actual different lesions or cystic changes. Um, so it really, again, it takes evaluating to determine what it is, what's the best way to remove it. Um, but usually they're removed um, by, by trimming them off. Okay. All right. Uh, viewer in Sioux Falls says they have prisms in glasses. Is there anything that can be done for the eye that uh, may be done to counteract that instead of using the prisms? Well, prism, you know, we, since we have two eyes and they both have a, a macula that sees sharply, out to whatever they're looking at, we call it the line of sight. Okay. If the eyes aren't lining up perfectly, the patient, the person can see double. Uh. You know, when they're, you know, two years old, mm -hmm. their their brain actually starts to shut off one of the images, and they're they can you know not develop normal vision in their brain. That's why you want even your you know baby to have an eye exam just to make sure the eyes are working well together, because prism can what it can do for a, a child or an adult is bend the light rays to bring the images together 
if their eye muscles aren't able to bring their eyes together. And if the glasses are something they want to you know, get rid of, then they would go to an eye surgeon who does eye muscle surgery because our eye has these muscles that help it go left, right, up, down, turn in, turn out. And you can measure and treat those muscles in a way that brings the eyes together. All right, now you're bringing me back to anatomy. Yeah. <laughs> We're learning yeah. all of those yeah. cranial nerves yeah. and muscles. Oh, all right. It's always important, I think, to realize you can get double vision from a cataract or dry eye. So if you have double vision that when you close one eye, it's gone, mm -hmm. oftentimes that's from an eye muscle issue. And you should try that with each eye. But if you cover an eye and you still have the double vision, mm. that's oftentimes a cataract okay. or a dry eye. All right, so. sounds good. Well, we've got about a minute left. Any final thoughts that you want to share with our viewers? Um, I guess just from like a glaucoma perspective, but just again encourage people to get it their yearly eye exams, um, especially as you get into that you know second half of your life, um, mm -hmm. 40 and over. Every couple years in the 40s, definitely age 60 yearly after that. If you know you have a family history of it, make sure you're getting even earlier exams. Um, but yeah, it's just really important for prevention with glaucoma. Okay, so early. Yes. <laughs> I've been amazed at the quality of the questions, and it's been yeah, an absolute been honor fun. to do this with you, Dr. Dickus. And I, I just want to emphasize don't rub your eyes. It, it, it absolutely amazes how many people I've seen ruin their own vision and they didn't realize they were rubbing or they were face planting into a pillow mm -hmm. and creating pressure on their eyes all night. Mm -hmm. So you okay. really want to not be putting pressure on your eyes. All right, so if you get something in your eye, how do you get it out? Well, you, you can flush it with a drop it. and you can okay. gently rub, but just mm -hmm. be gentle with your eye. All right. all right, well, this has been a fascinating, evening. I have been loving all of these questions, lots of terms that we had to define, lots of things we had to discuss, and lots of physics you were reminding me of. <laughs> so, you know, now I, I kind of want to go back to residency yeah, and into ophthalmology. You guys, I, I think you've got one of the more interesting specialties here. Yeah, so yeah, We both really enjoy it. I yeah, think you can rewarding. tell that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I can tell that you're both yeah. very articulate, very passionate about uh, your specialty. I am so honored that you both came and I hope we can invite you back because there's more questions okay. we weren't able to get to. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Well, the winner of our prize tonight is Darla from Iowa. Thank you, Darla, for asking a question during the first 20 minutes of the show. A gift will be sent to you. We'll be back after this. In healthcare, misinformation can be as deadly as the most serious disease and spread just as quickly. For 21 seasons, the Prairie Doc organization has provided health information based on honest science in a respectful and compassionate manner. Medical professionals from your own communities volunteer each week to answer your questions. There is no cost to call in or to watch our shows. Follow The Prairie Doc on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube to access the entire Prairie Doc library today. Johnny Nash may have started his song with, I can see clearly now the rain has gone. But what about someone with cataracts? They cannot easily see all of the obstacles in their way. And there are not dark clouds that make you blind, like in the song, but cataracts do cause vision clouding. Cataracts is the name given to the clouding of lenses in the eye. These lenses allow light to pass through the eye to the retina, where the signal is sent to the brain so we can perceive the world around us. Common symptoms of cataracts include blurred, clouded, or dimmed vision. They can also make it more difficult to see at night or cause halos around lights. While anyone can develop cataracts, it is most common as people age, with over 50% of people over the age of 80 having cataracts. However, there are some infants who are born with cataracts due to genetic issues, trauma, or an infection prior to birth. Most commonly, cataracts develop due to an age-related change as the proteins and fibers that create the lenses of the eye break down and clump together, causing clouding of the lenses. Because cataracts typically develop slowly over time, the effects may not be obvious until the progression is advanced. 
While it is common for cataracts to affect both eyes, often one eye progresses faster or is worse than the other. Cataracts can also affect different areas of the eyes. The area affected will result in different problems with vision. Cataracts affecting the center of the lenses may cause issues with reading or yellowing of the vision. Cataracts at the edges of the lenses will cause issues with judging distance, difficulty differentiating colors, and can cause double vision in the affected eye. The last type of cataracts is when the back of the lenses are affected, reducing vision in bright light and making reading difficult. This type also tends to be faster growing than other types of cataracts. Factors that can increase the risk of developing cataracts include modifiable and unmodifiable things. Factors that you can change include excessive exposure to bright sunlight, excessive alcohol use, smoking, obesity, and prolonged use of corticosteroid medications. While age is the only truly unmodifiable risk factor, diabetes, previous eye injuries or surgeries, and high blood pressures can be controlled. The most common treatment for cataracts is surgery. This surgery involves removing the clouded lens and replacing it with a clear artificial lenses. Once placed, these lenses are permanently left in the eye. This is generally an outpatient surgery, meaning you do not need to spend the night in the hospital. The procedure is relatively quick with a low risk of complications. Most people heal within a few weeks. Afterwards, you can enjoy that rainbow you've been praying for and enjoy every bright, bright, sunshiny day. Well, thank you to our guests, Dr. Karen Dickus and Dr. Vance Thompson, for volunteering their time to help us learn more about eye health. If you would like to see and hear more episodes of this program, please like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube, or visit us at prairiedoc.org. Look for Prairie Doc Perspectives in your local newspaper or online, and be sure to look for the podcast of this program, Prairie Doc On Call, wherever you get your podcasts. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, thanks for joining us for another episode of health information based on science, built on trust. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Ethnic minorities are disproportionately at risk of being uninsured, lacking access to care, and experiencing worse health outcomes from preventable and treatable conditions. Underrepresented populations, next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. Effective use of information is the foundation of modern public health practice. Hello, I'm Dr. Jennifer May of Rapid City, and I serve as a volunteer board member for the Healing Words Foundation, the 501c3 that supports the Prairie Doc Media. Prairie Doc programming is designed to improve health literacy, including improving knowledge which is conducive to individual and community health. Founded by Rick and Joni Holm, Prairie Docs and other medical professionals volunteer many hours every week to share information based on science built on trust. Thank you for following Prairie Doc Media on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Plus, catch us most Thursday nights at 7 p.m. on SDPB. Because of your generous donations, all Prairie Doc programming is free and available to the public. If so inclined, make a donation today. Please help us continue this important work. Go to prairiedoc.org and click the donate button. Don't want to donate online? Send us an email and our staff will send you a pledge card in the mail. Thank you for supporting the Prairie Doc, information based on science, built on trust. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by 
At Avera, our nationally recognized health system will be right here with you, with care and coverage. Hello, possibility. Hello, healthy. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, First Bank and Trust, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Vance Thompson Vision, Monument Health, Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings Madison Flandreau District Medical Society, Pier District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, the Orthopedic Institute, Lake Ponset Sailing Academy, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, South Dakota American Colleges of Physicians, and Swift Health Communications.